Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udzu billahi minasy syaithanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Assalatu wassalam ala rasulil karim. On behalf of Masjid As-Siddiq, I would like to welcome you and thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Today we have Imam Sheikh Adib Zaman who will be enlightening us on the story of Kaab Ibn Malik. As he goes through the story, I ask that you write a couple of questions down. And after he finishes, we will take three questions from the sisters and three from the brothers. Time, time is short. Uh, without further ado, I give you to Imam Sheikh Adib. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <coughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this is uh, our first uh, family program of the month or our monthly family program uh, welcome everyone here today إن شاء الله تعالى we'll be going over the story of Kaab ibn Malik Kaab ibn Malik رضي الله عنه uh, before we begin how many people show of hands, have heard of Ka'b ibn Malik before? How many people have heard him? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Even if you uh, heard him or you have not heard him, Ka'b ibn Malik, he doesn't have much mention in the uh, hadith. He has a hadith, few hadiths here and there. But what we're going to read, the story of Ka'b ibn Malik today, is what he's most known for. And he doesn't have very much mention other than this hadith, which is a very long hadith. And it goes over a story that he recounts of himself. And this is a story that happened 40 years ago. He's narrating the story to his son 40 years after the incident, after he has become blind. And he is in a state of regret because we will see what happened uh, and why he is regretful. Uh, this story, before we uh, mention uh, Kaab uh, and the details of the story, as he narrates in the first person, we will go over uh, a background of uh, the story and when it occurred and the circumstances uh, behind it. So first, who is Ka'b ibn Malik? He was a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu specifically from the Ansar. And uh, he was a person who witnessed the pledge of Al-Aqaba, Bay'atul Aqaba. And Bay'atul Aqaba was the precursor to the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Before the Prophet Sallallahu migrated, he was looking for a place to migrate and establish the Islamic State. So he went to a Ta'if and he found hostile reaction. And we know the story of what happened in Ta'if. And he was stoned and he was thrown out in a very, uh, in a very uh, terrible manner. And he was meeting with other delegations and nothing was coming to fruition. Until he met with the Ansar and they believed in him and they had meetings and eventually they had a pledge called the Pledge of Aqaba and this was a pledge in which they uh, made their allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu and agreed to host him and let him come to Medina and be the leader. So uh, Ka'b ibn Malik was a person who witnessed this pledge. So he was amongst the first believers uh, from amongst the Ansar. And this is an elite category of the Sahaba. Allah praises the Sabiqeen Allah praises in the Quran the uh, early Muslims from the Muhajireen and the Ansar, those who were there at the very beginning. And Ka'ab was one of those. He took part in all of the battles of the Prophet, all of them, with the exception of Badr and Tabuk, which is the subject of the story. He didn't take part in Tabuk, and we'll see why. And he did not take part in Badr, and he will also mention why. Uh, he took part in Uhud and he had a very prominent role in the Battle of Uhud and he displayed a lot of courage and bravery during the Battle of Uhud and he was one of those who remained firm and defended the Prophet Sallallahu as we know in the Battle of Uhud the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was injured and there were rumors that he was killed and Ka'b ibn Malik was one of those who stood firm and defended the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was also one of the poets of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet Sallallahu had a handful of poets you can count them uh, on your hand, how many poets he had, maybe three or four. And Ka'b ibn Malik was one of these. So he was amongst the elite of the Sahaba. He's not just 
of the lower tier of the Sahaba. He was up there in rank. And so, what his actions during this uh, expedition, it came as a disappointment to the Prophet ﷺ. And uh, as we will see, the reasons why uh, this happened, and he will explain in detail what happened. Uh, this incident occurred during the Battle of Tabuk. And the Battle of Tabuk occurred during the ninth year of Hijrah. Very late. The Prophet ﷺ would live maybe a year or two after only. This is very late. And this was, it's called the battle, it's called Ghazwat Tabuk. But it was actually, there was no battle fought. There was no bloodshed, there was no fighting actually happened. The Muslims, they marched all the way to the land of the Romans. Because one of the uh, ambassadors of the Prophet ﷺ was killed. And this was something that no time or civilization ever accepts that you kill an ambassador. But uh, these, these people, they killed the ambassador of the Prophet Sallallahu and so, And they thought that he's not going to come and march all the way up here to the land of the Romans. And they thought that they would get away with it. But he, he prepared this army. And this army was almost 30,000. The largest army ever assembled up to that point. Uh, and so they marched all the way up to the land of the Romans. And when they got there, nobody was there. They had run away. Uh, so there was actually no fighting that occurred during this battle. It's called the battle, but it's really an expedition. Uh, but the real battle was in the preparation. A lot of preparation took place uh, before the battle. In the journey, it was a long journey, the longest uh, expedition they had up to this point. In the way back, there were a lot of incidents that happened in this battle. Before, uh, in the preparation, while they were marching to towards the, the battle and on their way back, a lot of things happened. And uh, Allah Azza wa Jal dedicates a number of verses in the Quran speaking about the battle of Tabuk in a particular surah. Anybody knows what surah is? This is discussed in detail. Anybody knows? Very long chapter in the Quran. Not surah Ma'idah. Anybody knows? We're going once, twice. Surah Tawbah. Okay, Surah Tawbah discusses in detail the battle of Tabuk and what happened uh, during this battle. Now this battle, uh, as we said, it was very far away. And it was in the heat of summer. Very hot, extremely hot. It's a long march, and it was very hot. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu announced beforehand where he was going, right? Uh, usually he would not announce where he was going because this is part of war strategy, right? When you're going out for battle, you don't say where you're going. So usually in the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu he would not in indicate where he's going. But in this battle, he let everyone know, we are going here, be ready. And he gave the warnings to everyone, be ready, prepare yourself for the battle. And so preparations were made. And out of the people who took part in this expedition, or the people who were involved in this expedition, we can categorize them into uh, four categories, four categories. The first category were the strong believers, and these were the majority of the Sahaba. The majority of the Sahaba, they obeyed the Prophet ﷺ, they made the preparations on time, and they left with him, and they marched to Tabuk. These were the majority of the Sahaba. A second category of people wanted to go. They wanted to go, but they had excuses which prevented them from going. So amongst them were the sick, Amongst them were the weak, the elderly, the handicapped. And amongst them were people who could not find anything to finance themselves to go. Because in this battle, you could not march on foot. You needed a riding animal. So uh, in this second category, they wanted to go, but they were not able to go. And Allah mentions this category in the Quran. He says, uh, that it is no blame on the weak and the handicapped and those who do not find anything to, to spend to, uh, to prepare themselves for the battle because they needed a riding animal. Uh, so this was the second category of people. And there were some people who came to the Prophet وسلم, and they begged him to take, him, take them on the expedition. And he had to turn them away. And he said to them, I don't have anything, I don't have any riding animals for you. And so they had to be turned away. 
and they turned away and, uh, and their, their eyes were full of tears. So this was the second category of people uh, who wanted to go on expedition, but they had an excuse, either they were handicapped or they were too elderly or they had uh, financial hardship preventing them from uh, being able to find an animal and weapons and so on. The third category were the hypocrites, the munafiqun. And there were a number of them. And they, not only did they remain behind, but they also were very negative and they, started to, they tried to discourage the believers from going. So amongst the things they said was, لا تنفروا في الحر Do not go in the heat, it's too hot. All right, and then Allah responded, قُلْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمَ أَشَّدُّ حَرَّ That the, the, the hellfire is even hotter. So they, they tried all these uh, ways of, of uh, lowering the spirits of the believers. And uh, when the believers would come with their, uh, with, with their sadaqa to fund the, fund the army, they would make all sorts of comments. So a person would come with a lot of wealth and they would say he's murai, he's showing off. Right? He's coming because he, he's bringing all this wealth because he wants to show off. And then a person would come very little bit, very little bit because it's all he has. And they would say Allah does not need this person's little amount. What is, what is the army going to do with this little amount? So they were very negative and they were trying to dissu dissu uh, dissuade the, the Muslim, the believers from uh, going forth in the battle. So this was the third category. Those who left, who stayed behind, but they stayed behind because of their hypocrisy. They were not true believers, the munafiqun. And then you had a fourth category, which were the outliers. And there were three people. And Ka'b ibn Malik was one of them. These were true believers, right? They were, there's no question of their iman and their, and their faith. But they had no excuse. They, let, they remind, remained behind without any excuse whatsoever. And Ka'b ibn Malik was amongst those. And you had as well two other uh, companions. So let us read the story of Ka'b ibn Malik and his uh, explanation of what happened during this battle. Uh, so he's narrating this in the first person. He's narrating this in the first person 40 years after uh, this incident to his son. So he says, I never remained behind Allah's Messenger وسلم, from any expedition which he undertook except the Battle of Tabuk and the Battle of Badr. So far as the Battle of Badr is concerned, nobody was blamed for remaining behind as Allah's Messenger وسلم, and the Muslims did not set out for attack, but uh, they intended the caravan of Quraysh. So he did not attend the Battle of Badr. But the Battle of Badr was not a planned battle. The Muslims did not plan to meet in battle. Rather, they were intending to attack the caravan of Quraysh. Right? They were going out, attending, uh, intending to attack the caravan of Quraysh. And they did not intend battle. So when the battle occurred, the Prophet ﷺ did not blame those who remained behind because they didn't know there was going to be a battle. And they went out without any pre-arrangements, uh, any arrangements being made. And Allah mentions this in the Quran, وَلَوْ تَوَاعَدْتُمْ لَاخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِي الْمِيعَادِ Allah says that even if they had made plans for the battle, they would not have met the way Allah planned for them to meet. They met in the way, the most perfect way that Allah planned. And we know what happened in the Battle of Badr. So he says that I did not, uh, I did not attend Badr. But the Prophet ﷺ did not blame anyone who missed Badr because this was not a planned battle. This was something that occurred uh, spontaneously. But it was Allah who made them confront their enemies without the intention to do so. And then he says, I had the honor to be with Allah's Messenger on the night of Aqaba. As we mentioned Aqaba later, that he was amongst those who witnessed the pledge of Aqaba. When we pledge our allegiance to Islam and is more dear to me than participation in the battle of Badr. Although Badr was more popular amongst the people as compared with that of Tabuk. So he says that uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make Badr, but I made Aqaba. And I would not have exchanged Aqaba for Badr, even though everybody knows Badr. Right? Nobody, how many people have heard of Aqaba? Very, very few. Unless you study the seerah, very few people have heard of the Pledge of Aqaba. But without the Pledge of Aqaba, there is no Battle, battle of Badr, and there's no Uhud, and there's no conquest of Mecca, and there's nothing that comes after. Because the, the, the Pledge of Aqaba it paved the way for the Prophet ﷺ to migrate to Al Medina and set up the Islamic State, and then from there, he conquered the entire Arabia. So he says, Ka'b ibn Malik, that 
I didn't witness Badr, but I had Aqaba, and I would not trade Badr for Aqaba. I would not trade Badr for Aqaba. And then he says, and this is my story of remaining back from Allah's messenger on the occasion of the Battle of Tabuk. He says, never did I possess enough uh, circumstances more favorable than the occasion of this expedition. He had come across an, uh, wealth, and Ka'b ibn Malik was known to be poor. So up to this point, he was always known to be a poor person. But during the Battle uh, of Tabuk, all of a sudden, he came into uh, a large amount of wealth. And he also says that I never before this expedition possessed two rides. He had two camels. All right? uh, even in those days, one camel is having a lot. Right? Camels are very expensive. So he had two camels. And he says, never before this, I had two camels. And never before this, I had the amount of wealth that I had. All right? So he is basically saying that he was... A, at this point, very comfortable in living. Right? He had a very comfortable living. Before this, he, he might have struggled financially. But now he has a lot of wealth. And he has two camels. And this is the first time that he ever had this. And he says, Allah's Messenger وسلم, set out for this expedition in extremely hot season. The journey was long and the land was waterless. And he had to confront a large army. So all of the reasons not to go are there. The expedition is long, it's like a month or two months travel. It's extremely hot in the desert of Arabia. The enemy is a lot larger. So the Muslims set out with maybe about 30,000. The accounts say that it was uh, 100 or 200,000 of the enemy that were in the lands that they were marching to. So the enemy is a lot. The march is very far and the heat is intense. So all the reasons to stay behind are there. In addition to his personal circumstances, he has the wealth, he has the riding animals. And so he says, so uh, the land was waterless and, we had to con and he had to confront a large army. So he informed the Muslims about the situation so that they could equip themselves for the expedition. And he also told them the destination where he intended to go. As we mentioned, this time the Prophet ﷺ intended to go to a destination and he announced it. He, he normally would not do this. He would not an announce where he's going for war strategy, battle strategy. But because the, the destination was so far away and it required so much preparation, he announced where he is going well beforehand so that they could prepare. And the Muslims who accompanied Allah's Messenger at that time were large in numbers, but there was no record to record them. There was no, uh, there was no uh, uh, book that recorded the uh, register to record the names of all the people going. Right? 30,000 people are going. Nobody's going to know who is left behind. Nobody's going to know. There's 30,000 people going. If somebody remains behind, then it's not going to be hard for anybody to notice them unless the revelation comes down and points out that this person remained behind. So there was no record uh, or register to record who is going. And Kaab says, few were the persons who wanted the absence themselves and were under the impression that they could easily conceal, conceal themselves. So it was very easy to remain behind. And the only way that a person would uh, be exposed is if Allah reveals something uh, of the revelation. Until revelations came from Allah, the exalted. And Allah's messenger set out on an expedition where the fruits were ripe and their shadows had been lengthened. So it's another reason to remain behind. This is a time where the fruits were ripe, were, were ripe and there was a lot of shade in Medina. So all the reasons to stay behind are there. It's a very intense test for, for Ka'b ibn Malik and all the Sahaba in general, but for him specifically, because of his situation, now he has come across all this wealth and he has all these riding animals and the, roots, uh, the fruits are ripe and the shade is uh, very comfortable. So the Muslims began their preparations. Allah's Messenger وسلم, made preparations and the Muslims too along with them. And he says, I set out in the morning so I, should make the, so I can make the preparations along with them. But I came back and did nothing. So he, he goes out, he wants to make the preparations, but he comes back and he finds that he hasn't done anything for the day. And he said to himself, that I have the means enough to do so whenever I want. Right? He's basically saying that I, I could do this. Right? It's not a big deal. I can still make the preparations, even though he has not made the preparations. 
He says, I have means enough to make the preparations as soon as I want. I can do, I can, you know, flip the, flip the switch and the preparations will be made. It's easy, simple. Uh, and I went on doing this, postponing the preparations until people were about to depart and it was the morning that Allah's Messenger set out. So he kept on delaying and delaying and kept on saying that I can, I can make the preparations, not a big deal, until the day for them to depart. All right, so this type of delaying, delaying, what do we call this? Procrastination. In Arabic, they call it tasweef, right? Procrastination. And this is one of the major lessons in the story of Ka'b ibn Malik, that uh, the dangers of procrastination. And now we, everybody procrastinates at some point, right? Uh, we're not going to pretend like we, nobody procrastinates. I might have procrastinated in uh, you know, preparing this lecture, right? Everybody procrastinates, but there's a limit, right? There's a limit in procrastination. And you get to a certain point where if you procrastinate long enough, you come to the point where you're not going to be able to achieve the goal that you want to achieve. And Ka'b ibn Malik, he reached this limit where he procrastinated too much to the point where he was not able to make the preparations needed. So the day of departure came and the Muslims set out. The Prophet set out along with the Muslims and Ka'b ibn Malik says, but I made no preparations. And still he was intending to go. So he says, I went early in the morning and came back, but I made no decision. I continued to do so until they, the Muslims, hastened and covered a good deal of distance. So even after they left, right, the, the army has left, and it's been a few days, and he's still thinking that he can catch up. And it's actually possible to catch up, because the army moves very slow. Right? The army, this is an army of 30,000 people, and it's not just the soldiers, you have uh, the cooks, you have uh, the nurses, you have other people in the army, so they have to move at a certain pace. So it's possible for an individual to catch up to the army even after they have departed uh, after a few days. So he still had the intention of catching up to the army. And so the army set out and he still has in his mind that he's going to march and meet them. And then he says that I wish that I did that. I wish that I did that. But he didn't. So he still had this intention to go, but he did not go. Uh, and he said, w I wish that I did that, but it was not destined for, for me. After the departure of Allah's Messenger وسلم, I went out amongst the people, and I was shocked to find that I did not find anyone like me, but people, all he found were people who were known to be hypocrites or accused of hypocrisy, or people who had a legitimate excuse. All right, so he returns uh, back, and he's walking in the markets of, uh, of Medina, and only people he sees are hypocrites, people accused of hypocrisy, or people who had a legitimate excuse. All right, so now he's starting to be, become a bit worried. Right? Why am I the only believer, right, true believer here, with no excuse? So he becomes a bit uh, you know, fearful uh, of seeing only hypocrites and only seeing people who have legitimate excuses. Uh, and then he says, uh, and Allah's Messenger وسلم, took no notice of me until he had reached Tabuk. So, as we said, the army was very large and no one's keeping track of who's, who's going. And so the Prophet ﷺ did not notice Ka'b ibn Malik missing until they reached all the way to Tabuk, maybe a month into the journey. And then, one day as they were sitting amongst themselves, the Prophet ﷺ finally asked and noticed that Ka'b ibn Malik is missing. And he says, what happened to Ka'b? What did Ka'b do? What did Ka'b do? Where is Ka'b? And this shows that the Prophet ﷺ had a great love uh, for Ka'b ibn Malik. As we said, he's from the elite of the Sahaba. He's not just a uh, rank and file Sahabi. He was from the elite of the Sahaba. And the Prophet ﷺ noticed he was missing amongst all of the, the army. He noticed that Ka'b is not there. And so he asked about him. What happened to Ka'b? And a person from Banu Salama, and this is the, the, the tribe of Ka'b ibn Malik, Banu Salama is his tribe. A person from Banu Salama said, Allah's Messenger, he said to Allah's Messenger, the beauty of his cloak and his appreciation of his sides has allured him. And thus he was thus detained. So this person kind of uh, had some negative thoughts on him. He said that basically he got caught up in the dunya and because of his love of the dunya, he stayed behind. And uh, basically having negative thoughts of him and backbiting him. And after that, uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he stood up and he said, to, uh, woe to you, well, you know, what an evil thing you have said. We know nothing of good from Ka'b. So Mu'adh ibn Jabal defended 
Ka'b ibn Malik, and this is also a very important lesson, that sometimes we might see something or hear something about somebody, and we should not assume the worst. We should have husn al good uh, thoughts, good thoughts about our fellow believers, even if we hear something that displeases us. So this, these companions, they heard that Ka'b ibn Malik has stayed behind. And they know that he was a young man, that he was uh, fit, that he was healthy, that he had really no excuse to stay back. And it's easy to fall into ill thoughts. And this person who made this statement, he fell into this mistake. He ended up backbiting uh, Ka'b ibn Malik and making some uh, disparaging remarks against him. I notice when Ka'b ibn Malik is he's giving, the, uh, he's giving the narration, he's saying what happened, he did not mention the name of this person. He said a person from Banu Salama. And he knows who this person is. This is from his tribe, right? He knows who is the person who said this. But uh, he concealed. And he could have shamed the person. And he could have said that so-and-so said this about me. But he did not say who the person was. He said a person from Banu Salama uh, said this about me. And Mu'adh ibn Jabal defended the Prophet uh, He defended uh, Ka'b ibn Malik. And he said that we only know good from Ka'b ibn Malik. Uh, after that, uh, uh, the Prophet kept quiet. He did not say anything. So after Mu'adh ibn Jabal, he defended Ka'b ibn Malik. He said, we only know good from him. And the Prophet was silent. And it was during this time that a person dressed in all white garment uh, came through the horizon. It was coming, riding, riding through the horizon. And uh, shattering the mirage in, in the desert, you know, you see mirages, and this person is shattering the mirage as they come riding in the distance. And the Prophet وسلم, he had a hope that it would be a certain individual. He said, "Kun Abu Khaythama." He said, uh, "Let it be Abu Khaythama." And sure enough, it was a person by the name of Abu Khaythama Al Ansari. And this person had had trouble finding uh, finances to come to the battle. He had come with a, 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 a bunch of dates, a few dates, to, uh, to uh, give in charity to the army. And this is when the munafiqun, they said what they said. They said that Allah has no need for this person's uh, few dates. What is the army going to do with these dates? So this is uh, Abu Khaythama. So he had trouble finding finances to uh, fund himself and join the army. But he was able to, uh, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to find something. And so he caught up with the army. Right, he caught up with the army and he met with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after that, Ka'b ibn Malik says, when this news reached me, that Allah's Messenger was on his way back. So now this, the, the, the Tabuk expedition has finished. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is on his way back now. He's on his way back. And everyone is preparing their excuses. So the Munafiqun, those who remain back without excuses, uh, they're starting to think about what are they going to say. And Ka'b ibn Malik as well, he's starting to get worried. And he's, going, he's starting to panic. What is he going to say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How is he going to explain that he has remained back without any excuse? And so he says that when, this, when the news reached me that Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on his way from back from Tabuk, I was very worried. He said, I became very worried. And I asked myself, uh, how am I going to explain myself? And how am, I, how am I going to save myself from the anger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And so he said, he, thought, he said, I thought of fabricating stories. I thought now, uh, maybe I'm going to make something up. I'm going to make a story up. I'm going to make a false, fake excuse. And the Prophet sallallahu is going to believe me. And I'm going to save myself from the anger of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he started to think of uh, lies that he could tell to get himself away from the anger of the Prophet And he started to help, uh, seek help from some of his fellow tribesmen, seeking their advice, asking them, what should I tell Rasulullah when he comes back? How can I avoid his anger? And he's, he, you know, he's, he's putting a lot of thought into how he's going to explain to the Prophet what happened. And after that, he says that uh, when it was said to me that Allah's Messenger was about to arrive, all the false ideas vanished from my mind. And I came to the conclusion that nothing can save me but telling the truth. So I decided to speak the truth. And it was in the morning that Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, arrived. 
So eventually he came to the realization that I cannot make up any lies. I have to tell the truth. I cannot make up any false excuses. Uh, I have to tell the truth. And whatever consequences that come with that, I have to bear the consequences. And so Allah's Messenger arrived in the morning. And it was his habit that as he came back from a journey, he would first go to the masjid and pray two rak'at. This is a sunnah, uh, a neglected sunnah, that when you come back from a journey, you don't go to your house, you go to the masjid and you offer two rak'at and then uh, proceed to your house. And this was the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever he would come back from a journey, he would, the first place he would go was to the masjid and he would offer two units of prayer. And so he went to the masjid and after he offered the units of prayer, he sat in the masjid. And the people started to file in, one by one, coming with their excuses. al uh, As Allah says in the Quran, uh, The people of excuses came. And they started to offer all of their excuses. And there were about 80 of them in number. Uh, those who had remained behind, they began to put forward their excuses. And swear, وَيَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ لكم. And they would swear by Allah, I swear this is what happened. I swear that this happened or I couldn't come because of this reason. And they were making up all sorts of lies. And these were, of course, the munafiqun, the hypocrites. And the Prophet ﷺ sat and he accepted their excuses. And he uh, accepted their oath of allegiance. He sought forgiveness for them and he let them go along their way. So he did not. Uh, call anybody into account. He accepted their excuses and he left their affair with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the policy of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to the munafiqun. That the munafiqun were known. Right? They were known who they were. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salud, he was the leader of the munafiqun and he was known amongst the people. And the Prophet ﷺ would, uh, his policy was to leave the munafiqun alone. He did not uh, pressure them and he did not uh, attack them or kill them or do anything of the, of the, of the sort. And he would be very gentle with them in hope that they would eventually come to their senses and become true believers. And he also did this because he did not want to pe the people, the outsiders, non-Muslims, to get any bad ideas about Islam. So once the Prophet uh, was coming back from uh, one of the other expeditions, and it reached him that Abdullah ibn Ubay, the leader of the Munafiqun, he said some very harsh words, insulting words about the Prophet wasallam. And so Umar radiallahu an, he sought permission. He said to uh, Allah's Messenger, allow me to get rid of this guy. Let me cut off his head. And the Prophet he responded, he says, no. لا يتحدث الناس أن محمد يقتل أصحابه. No, I don't want the people to say that Muhammad is killing his companions. Because the people, the non-Muslims, they don't see who is a believer from a munafiq, a hypocrite. All they see is the, uh, the Messenger sallallahu and these are his followers. So if they see that he is killing people who are claiming to be his followers, then they're going to have a very negative uh, image of Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to prevent this negative image. And so he said, I don't want people to say that Muhammad is killing his companions. And so this was the policy of the Prophet ﷺ to leave the munafiqun, unless of course they did something very uh, extreme or they started to cause uh, uh, danger to the Muslims, then th he would respond. So the Prophet ﷺ, accepted their excuses on face value and accepted allegiance and he sought forgiveness for them and he left their secret intentions to Allah. And then Ka'b ibn Malik comes and he sits in front of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu asked him, what kept you back? Why didn't you come? And he asked him, could you not afford to go for a ride? Did you have a ride? You couldn't afford it? And Ka'b ibn Malik says, that he addressed the Prophet Sallallahu He says, Allah's Messenger, by Allah, if I were to sit in the presence of anyone else from amongst the worldly people, I would have definitely saved myself from his anger on one pretext or the other because I have the skill of argumentation. So he says that if I had sat in front of anybody else, I would have wiggled my way out of this situation and I would have been able to uh, make up some kind of excuse in front of anybody else. But he says, as for you, O Messenger of Allah, that I know and I'm fully aware that if I put forward to you a false excuse to please you, that Allah will definitely provoke your wrath upon me sometime later. 
And if I speak the truth now, then you might be annoyed with me now, but later on, I hope that Allah will forgive me. And then he said, I had no excuse, no excuse whatsoever. He didn't, ex he didn't make up any false lies. He said, O Messenger of Allah, I had no valid excuse, nothing. I'm healthy, I'm strong, I had the wealth, the wealth, the resources, and no excuse. By Allah, I never possess so much good means, and I never had such favorable conditions for me as when I stayed behind and failed to join you. And so the Prophet Sallallahu responded, he said, uh, that this person, he has spoken the truth. He's truthful. However, his affair is going to be with Allah. And so he told him, uh, stand up and wait until Allah gives a decision on your case. So the Prophet knew he was speaking the truth, but he had to wait for Allah to make the decision. So he told him, get up and wait until Allah has given the decision of your case. So he said, I stood up and some people from Banu Salama followed me and they said to me, by Allah, we do not know about you that you committed any sin. So once again, this shows the status of Ka'bah bin Malik, that they said, we don't know that you've committed any sins before. He said, from the elite of the Sahaba, from the high ranking Sahaba. They said, we don't know that you committed any sins before. Uh, so why, did, why didn't you put together an excuse? Why didn't you show the, or give the Prophet an excuse. You showed inability to put forward an excuse before Allah's Messenger, as those who stayed behind him have put forward excuses. It would have been enough for you to put forward some excuse, and Allah's Messenger would have sought forgiveness, and you would have gone along your way. So they, they were you know, pressuring him and reprimanding him and telling him you should have put forward an excuse. And they continue to incite me, and he says, until I thought of going back to Allah's Messenger to contradict myself. He says that. I was almost about to go back and contradict myself and say that uh, the story I told you originally, that was a lie. And he was going to make up an excuse. And then I said to them, has anyone else met the same fate? Is there anybody else in this situation besides me? And they said, yes, two persons have met the same fate as fallen to you. And they have met the same, they've made the same statement as you have made which is that they had no excuses. So there are two other men who had the same situation. They offered no excuse to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he told them the same thing that he told Ka'ab, which is get up and wait for Allah to make his decision on you. So then Ka'ab asked them, who are they? Who are these two other men? And they said they are Murara ibn Rabi'ah and Hilal ibn Umayyah. And these were two pious persons who had participated in the battle of Badr. And so this was a good example for me, he says. Now he felt, felt a little better because now I'm not alone in this situation. Before, all he was seeing was munafiqoon uh, and people who had legitimate excuses. But now he has heard that there are two other people who also have excuses. And so he says that uh, after this, uh, I went away when they named these two persons and he didn't bother going back and uh, contradicting himself in front of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After he says that Allah's Messenger وسلم, forbade the Muslims to talk with these three people. So they were boycotted. So the command came from the Prophet وسلم, no one is allowed to speak to these three individuals. No one is allowed to talk to them. And in fact, no one is even allowed to look at them. No one was allowed to talk and no one even looked at them. And this is a type of punishment. This is a type of punishment uh, that nobody talks to you, nobody looks at you. And I think if anybody has ever been in that situation where somebody is ignoring you, the feeling, right? The feeling of being ignored or the feeling of not being looked at. It's a terrible feeling. And this is one of the punishments that Allah mentions on the Day of Judgment when He's threatening uh, disbelievers. Allah says that those who break the covenant of Allah, that they will have no share in the Akhirah. And Allah will not speak to them. And Allah will not look at them. So this is a type of punishment in and of itself. To not speak to somebody and to not look at them. And this was the punishment uh, that they were all boycotted. No one is allowed to speak to them. And no one is allowed to even look at them. And so the, no one was allowed to speak to any of these three. And so the people began to avoid us. And their attitude toward us changed. 
And he says that it seemed as though the whole atmosphere turned hostile against us. And uh, he says that we spent 50 nights in this very state. 50 nights. It's almost two months. No one is talking to them. No one is looking at them. Everyone is ignoring them. And this went on for 50 nights. Uh, Ka'b ibn Malik, he says that uh, we spent 50 nights in this state and my two, fi- my two friends, the other two, they confined themselves within their houses. And all they were doing was staying in their houses crying. They were depressed. They weren't coming out of their house. But Ka'b ibn Malik says that I was young and I was strong. And so he would go out. He was very determined to go out. And so he would pray with the jama'ah in the masjid. And he would walk in the markets. While the other two companions, they stayed in their houses crying. And so he says that I would go out and I would participate in the congregational prayers. And I would go about in the bazaar. But no one is speaking to me. He's going, he's walking. No one is speaking to him. No one is looking at him. I came to Allah's Messenger وسلم, as he sat amongst the people after the prayer, greeted him and asked myself whether his lips stirred in response to my greeting. So he would go and he would give salam to the Prophet But he was not sure whether the Prophet responded or not. He, was, he said, I wasn't sure. Did the Prophet move his lips or no? He wasn't sure if the Prophet responded to him or not. And he says, then I reserved the prayer beside him. And he would, event, every once in a while he was praying, he would sneak a glance at the Prophet right? He would look from the corner of his eye, looking at the Prophet And he would see that the Prophet is also looking uh, stealthily at him. But when he would turn in the Prophet's direction, the Prophet would turn away. Right? So he, he never made direct contact, eye contact with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he says, when the harsh treatment of the Muslims towards me extended to a considerable length of time, I walked until I climbed upon the garden of Abu Qatada. So at the beginning, right, Kaaba, he's, he was young, he was strong, he tried to bear it, right? he tried to be strong. The other two companions, they stayed in their houses crying. But he tried to, you know, be mentally strong. But eventually, he started to break down. Right? This, this goes on for almost two months. Eventually, he starts to break down. And he feels the hostility of the people towards him. And so he decides that he's going to go to one of the most beloved people to him. And that is his cousin, Abu Qatada, who had a garden. And so he says, I walked until I climbed upon the wall of, of the garden of Abu Qatada. And he was my cousin, and I had the greatest love for him. And I greeted him, and by Allah, I did not, he did not respond to my greetings. So this is the most beloved person, this is his best friend. Right? His best friend. And he thinks that maybe you know, he's going to find some comfort in his best friend. And he climbs the wall, and he gives him salam, and no response. And nobody's doing this because they hate Ka'b ibn Malik. This is the command of Rasulullah right? This is a command. Everybody has to obey this command. I'm sure everyone wanted to speak to him, right? But they had to obey Allah's Messenger. And so he did not respond to my greetings. I said to him, Abu Qatada, I asked you by Allah, aren't you well aware of the fact that I love Allah and His Messenger the most? He kept quiet. He didn't answer. And he kept on repeating this, again repeating. Uh, I said again, aren't you aware of the fact that I love Allah and His Messenger the most? He kept quiet. And he kept on answering, uh, asking this question, and he's not receiving any answer uh, and then finally I think maybe the three or four times he's asking this question Abu Qatada he says not directly responding but he says Allah and his messenger know best right so he finally gave an answer but he's not directly responding because he doesn't want to disobey the Prophet Sallallahu so he doesn't directly say to him but he says Allah and his messenger know best and after this uh, Kaab says my eyes began to shed tears and I came back climbing down the wall, and I was, as I was walking in the bazaar of Medina, uh, a Nabati comes from Syria. A Nabati is like a farmer uh, from Syria. And he comes to me, this farmer, uh, he's coming to sell some food grains, and he, asks, he starts to ask the people, can you direct me to Ka'b ibn Malik? Who, where is Ka'b ibn Malik? And this person is from Syria, he's from the, uh, the, the, the Ghassaniyin, and these were the same uh, people who the, 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 the expedition of Tabuk was against. So when the Prophet marched to Tabuk, he was marching against the, 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 the people known as the, uh, the, the Ghassanids. Right? They were under the Roman Empire. So this man from Ghassan comes, and these are the very people that the Messenger had marched out to fight. 
So this man is coming and he's asking, where is Ka'bah bin Malik? And the people point to where Ka'bah bin Malik is. And he came and he delivered to me a letter from the king of Ghassan. He came and he delivered a letter from the king of Ghassan. And he said in this, in this letter, uh, coming to my point, it has been conveyed to us that your friend, referring to the Prophet Wasallam, has treated you cruelly. He has been cruel to you. And he has not put you, and he's not treated you in a way that you deserve. And he has degraded you. So come to us, and we will honor you. We will honor you. Come to us, join us, and we're going to treat you the way you deserve to be treated. And Ka'b says, as I read the letter, I said to myself, this is also from the test. This is also a test. And he says, I burnt the, uh, I burnt the letter. I put it in the, in the oven, and I burnt the letter. He realized that this is another test. He could have easily uh, gone and, and given up and joined the, the, the king of Ghassan. But he knows that this was a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he, bur- he burnt it. And then he says, when, 50, uh, when 40 days had passed, so 50 days they were in isolation. When 40 days had passed, uh, the, the command came that they had to uh, separate from their wives. The command came that you have to uh, stay away from your wives. And Ka'b ibn Malik, he says that should I divorce her? Or he wasn't sure. Was this a command to divorce? Or should I just stay away from her? And it was said to him, no, you don't have to divorce, but stay away from her. And uh, this was also said to the other companions. Uh, the other companions, they were a bit older, so the Prophet gave them allowance for the wives to serve, serve them and still prepare for them food. And Ka'b ibn Malik, though, because he was young, he uh, was not given this or he didn't ask for this dispensation even though his companions were telling him why don't you go and also ask for the Prophet Sallam to allow your wife to still continue to serve you but he said no I'm a strong young man and I'm not going to ask this of the Prophet uh, so this went on and now he's also not even allowed to see his wife and this went on for 50 nights this boycott and on the morning of the 50th night after I observed the dawn prayer and was sitting on one of the roofs of our houses and in this very state in which Allah says describing it's a verse in the Quran that life had became hard for myself and the earth had become compressed uh, despite its vastness and then he heard the name of an announcer so somebody comes running and is screaming at the top of their lungs saying and shouting to Ka'b ibn Malik uh, at the top of his voice, Ka'b ibn Malik, there has, bec- there has come glad tidings for you. Glad tidings have come for you. And when he heard this, immediately he falls in prostration. And he realized that this is the tawbah that Allah has accepted from him. And he fell down in prostration. And he came to realize that this was relief for me. I came to realize this was relief for me. And Allah's Messenger had informed the people of the acceptance of our repentance after we had offered the dawn prayer. And so the people, began, they came and they gave glad tidings to Ka'b ibn Malik and, and his two companions. And one of the, pers- uh, the people in particular came to him personally on a horse. And uh, this person, when he came, he gave the glad tidings. And Ka'b ibn Malik was so happy. He said he was so happy that I took off the garment that I was wearing and I gifted it to him. And he says that I didn't have any other garments besides that. So the only garment I had was this garment. Now, we said at the beginning of the story that he, was, he had come across some wealth. But now all of a sudden he has only one garment. What's happened in this period is that he has given sadaqah. Right? He's not sitting around feeling sorry for himself. He is trying to seek Allah's forgiveness. And one of the things he's doing in this time is he's giving away his wealth. He was giving sadaqah during this time. So now he only has one garment left. And he gifted this garment to the person who gave him the glad tidings. And so he ended up having to borrow a garment so that he could go and meet the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa so he borrowed a garment and he went and he met the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he greeted the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, the Messenger said to him uh, here is a greeting for you for your repentance being accepted by Allah and he says I moved until I came to the mosque the masjid and I, uh, I had bes- uh, and Allah's Messenger had been sitting amongst the persons and the first person who got up right so the first person who greeted him rushed to greet him was Talha ibn Ubaidillah so Talha was the first person to greet me and no one he says no one from the, amongst the muhajireen stood up besides Talha the only person who stood up to greet him was Talha and he says I never forget that what Talha did that he was the first person who get, got up and greeted me 
And he greeted Allah's Messenger and his face was glistening because of delight. So the Messenger وسلم, his face was shining because he was so happy of the repentance of Ka'b being accepted. And he said, let there be glad tidings and blessings for you, the like of which you have never found nor you will find today. And this is the best day in your entire life since your mother gave birth to you. And uh, Ka'b says, I said to Allah's Messenger, is this acceptance of repentance, is it from you, O Messenger of Allah, or is it from Allah Azza wa Himself? And he said, no, this is from Allah. This is coming from Allah Azza wa Himself. And uh, after that, Ka'b ibn Malik, he says that uh, he was so happy, he told the Messenger of I'm going to give you all my wealth in charity. And the Prophet told him, no, keep some, keep, keep some of your wealth, don't give everything away. And he eventually said that uh, I came across some wealth from Khaybar, the expedition of Khaybar, and I'm going to give that away in charity because of Allah's accepting of my repentance. And he says, I do not know whether anyone amongst the Muslims was put to a more severe trial than I because of telling the truth. And since then, since that day when I made up my mind to tell Allah's Messenger the truth, since that day, I've not told a lie. I've never told a lie since then. And I hope that Allah would save me from the trials from the rest of my life because of this. And certainly Allah has turned in mercy to the Prophet ﷺ and the immigrants and the helpers and those who followed him in the, heart, in the hour of hardship. After the hearts of a part of them were about to deviate, then he turned to them in, in mercy. Surely to them he is compassionate and merciful. All right, so this is the story of Ka'b ibn Malik and his... Uh, repentance, a very beautiful story, long story as we've seen, uh, but in the end, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted their repentance. And we have a number of lessons, we mentioned some of them already, the dangers of procrastination, putting things off, saying uh, tomorrow, and going along this type of uh, thinking. As we said, everyone procrastinates to some level, but there's a limit, and if you cross that limit, then you risk losing uh, the goal that you set out to do. Uh, we also see the warning against backbiting, uh, the virtues of being truthful and not taking the easy way out. Ka'b ibn Malik could have taken the easy way out. He could have made up a story and offered an excuse. And the Prophet would have accepted it as he accepted from everyone else. And he would have gone along his way. But he took the hard way. But it was worth it in the end. As the Prophet says, this is the best day of your life since your mother gave birth to you. And lastly, from the lessons we see, is that Allah, He tests those who He loves. The munafiqun, they got off easy. Right? They offered their excuses, and nothing happened to them. No punishment came to them. But those who were sincere, they were the ones who were tested, and they were the ones who Allah forgives. أَشَدُّ nasi بَلَاءً الْأَنْبِيَاءِ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The people who have the most trials and tests are the prophets and those after them in rank and then those after them in rank. So Allah tests those whom he loves. And Ka'b ibn Malik was amongst those who he loves and so Allah accepted his repentance. And so uh, we have a lot of lessons to learn from this. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us benefit from the story of Ka'b ibn Malik. Make us from amongst the truthful. Allah says at the end of the story after mentioning uh, the verse mentioning those, the three who remain behind. And he says in the next verse, Oh, you who believe, fear Allah and be amongst the truthful. Be amongst the truthful. Uh, as Allah says in another verse, even if it's among, uh, against yourself, even if it's difficult, be amongst the truthful, it will be worth it in the end. It might be difficult at the beginning, but it will be worth it in the end and Allah's forgiveness is there for those who are truthful. Wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. I don't know if we have any uh, time for questions. Inshallah, if we have... Uh